Hello everyone. Welcome to this lecture of Two-Phase Flow. My name is Min Chang Li. I am currently a faculty at the Department of Power Mechanical Engineering in National Tsinghua University. Per the request from the university, I'm recording and sharing this series of lecturing for NTHU Open Courseware. This is a graduate level course on heat transfer with phase change typically offered in mechanical engineering department. It encompasses the fundamentals on the physics of phase change with the introduction to the practical analysis techniques for engineering applications. This course focuses on the heat transfer phenomena associated with phase change processes. Topics include thermodynamics phase change, evaporation, condensation, nucleation, bubble and droplet growth, two-phase flow modeling, convective boiling and condensation, as well as melting and solidification. There are three reference books used and recommended for this lecture. The first one is the liquid vapor phase change phenomena, written by Professor Van Carey. In fact, most of the lecture materials are based on this book and the lecture notes from Professor Carey's course. Therefore, for people who want to have more detailed information about this lecture regarding the liquid vapor phase change phenomena, it is strongly recommended to study this book. The second book is an excellent book for general heat and mass transfer and is typically used as a textbook for undergraduate heat transfer course in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. The chapter for boiling and condensation is sometimes skipped in the heat transfer course due to time limitation. It provides a great introduction and the basic concepts for the boiling and the condensation of fluids on solid surfaces. The third book is a classical textbook for heat conduction. In our lecture, we will introduce some basics on the heat transfer with melting and the solidification processes. And the lecture materials are based on the content provided in this book. Here is a more detailed list of topics that will be covered in this lecture. Starting from microscopic and the macroscopic perspectives of the liquid vapor interface, weighting phenomena, transport phenomena at the interfaces, phase stability, homogeneous and heterogeneous nucleation, pore boiling and the film boiling, the land of frost phenomena, the disjoining pressure effect, external condensation, two-phase flow modeling, internal convective condensation, convective boiling in tubes and channels, and finally, melting and solidification. When talking about liquid vapor phase change phenomena, perhaps the first impression would be the boiling and the condensation of water. These two videos on the left show vapor bubble formation in extensive liquid environments. It could be noticed that in one case, the bubble keeps floating towards the top due to buoyancy after its departure from the heated surface. But in the other case, the bubble shrinks and collapses rapidly. The differences on the bubble behaviors and the dynamics of such kind will significantly affect heat transfer characteristics of the system. The video on the right hand side corresponds to a fluid flow composed of liquid and vapor phases. The mass, momentum, and energy transports are all significantly different from a fluid flow with single phase. In particular, the interface between liquid and vapor plays an important role in the transfer processes. The physics, mechanisms, and analysis to this phenomena will be included in this lecture. The liquid vapor phase change process is also widely seen in industrial applications. For instance, this video shows the quenching of stainless steel 
by impinging a water jet onto a hot stainless steel surface with an initial temperature much higher than the boiling point of water. The rapid evaporation, vapor bubble formation, and the stabilities of the thin liquid and the vapor films all affect the cooling rate and the transient temperature profile of the stainless steel plate. Those phase change parameters must be precisely controlled in order to ensure the quality of the processed materials. Here, let's consider a hot surface in contact with the fluid. The surface temperature Tw is above the saturation temperature of the fluid, while the bulk temperature of the fluid at a distance away from the hot surface is kept at T infinity and is below its saturation temperature corresponding to the current condition. A basic and standard convective heat transfer analysis will lead to the usage of the Newton's law of cooling. To determine the convective heat transfer coefficient, h, one must take the factors of latent heat, surface tension, T wall, and delta T sub into account. Here, delta T sub is the subcooling temperature of the liquid outside the thermal boundary layer. Since the thermal boundary layer thickness is typically on the order of micrometers, it is obvious that the microscopic investigation and the analysis are required for dealing with the liquid vapor phase change phenomena. Other parameters such as surface tension and the local temperature gradients are also important and would dominate the heat transfer at the solid, liquid, and the vapor interfaces. In the aspect of a heat transfer coefficient, for free convection, H is on the order of 1 to 10 for most gases and it ranges from several tens to a thousand for liquids. The convective heat transfer coefficients for both gases and liquids are one to two orders greater than those for free convection. The convective heat transfer for cases involving boiling and condensation processes can be as high as several hundred thousand. Therefore, boiling and condensation are commonly seen in applications with high heat flux. Another important thing to be noted is the stability on temperature during a phase change heat transfer process. By taking the advantage from the latent heat, it is possible to obtain a significant amount of heat transfer with small temperature differences and variations. So, heat transfer with phase change is very useful for thermal management of systems that requires stable and a small temperature gradient. Now let's have a discussion on the nanoscale perspective for the liquid vapor interfacial region, which is chapter one of this reference book. By studying this chapter, the goal is to answer these three important questions about the liquid vapor interface at equilibrium. First, from the molecular point of view, how to define the equilibrium state and determine the corresponding PV diagram. Second, what is the characteristic length for the interfacial region? Third, what are the main effects of interfacial tension on the liquid vapor interface? First, introducing equation of state. These relations are useful for modeling and understanding the physics of gas molecule dynamics. The most well-known and simplest equation of state is ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. P is pressure, capital V is volume, N is number of moles, R is universal gas constant, T is temperature, M is molecular weight. The universal gas constant R equals Na times Kb. Na is Avogadro's number, Kb is Boltzmann constant. The ideal law is simple and it relates thermodynamic properties of a substance. However, 
there are lots of restrictions on the applicable range and the types of gas molecules. Also, noted that for a finite pressure, the ideal gas law predicts that if temperature goes to zero Kelvin, then the volume of the gas equals zero, which is not realistic. Therefore, it is apparent that the ideal gas law should be revised. A modified equation of state called the Van der Waals model is a more comprehensive PV and T relation derived from microscopic thermodynamics. Here, PV is associated with the volume occupied by the molecule themselves. The second term on the right-hand side of this equation accounts for the interactive forces between the molecules, the Van der Waals forces. Another molecule scale perspective for energy of a system can be illustrated by the Lennard-Jones potential model. Here, R is the distance between two molecules, and the phi represents the energy of this system. By looking at this curve of energy versus R in the region right to its minimum point, it is expected that energy must be supplied to move molecules apart from each other, which corresponds to the vaporization process. For condensation, where the distance between molecules are usually decreased, an amount of energy must be removed from this system. This amount of energy corresponds to the latent heat of phase change. From statistical thermodynamics, this set of relations for pressure, chemical potential, and internal energy can be derived. Also, it can be shown that for a Van der Waals fluid, these two coefficients can be determined on the basis of the critical temperature and the pressure of the fluid. With the definition of reduced temperature, pressure, and the specific volume, the Van der Waals relation becomes like this. Plot this equation of pressure versus specific volume at a constant temperature, in other words, along an isotherm. It is expected that a liquid vapor coexisting region shall present. From this figure, it is seen that for a specified temperature, there are three possible values of the specific volume for a given pressure. Obviously, the smallest one shall correspond to the saturated liquid, and the largest one shall be the reduced specific volume for saturated vapor. Now, the question is how to determine the saturation pressure, this red dashed line, for a given temperature. To answer this question, the chemical potential of the Van der Waals fluid should be applied. Some details for the derivation of this equation can be found in reference 1. For a flat liquid vapor interface at equilibrium, it is required that the temperature, pressure, and the chemical potential for the liquid and the vapor phases are equivalent. Here is the detailed procedure from the previous slide. The pressure temperature and the chemical potential for the liquid and the vapor phases at the saturation shall follow this requirement. P equals P sat, T equals T sat, and the chemical potentials for liquid and the vapor phases should be the same. By using the Van der Waals equation of state, the PV curve at a given temperature can be plotted like this one showing on the right. Next, postulate a value of pressure as the saturation pressure corresponds to this temperature. Three values of specific volumes can be obtained. Taking the minimum and the maximum values and plug them into this equation at the bottom to get the chemical potentials for liquid and the vapor phases correspondingly. The last step is to check if these two values of chemical potential are sufficiently close to each other. 
If so, then the postulated pressure is a good approximation to the saturation pressure. If those two values of chemical potential are significantly different, make a modified guess for the saturation pressure and repeat this analysis iteratively until the result is converged. Here we take a further look of a flat liquid vapor interface at equilibrium. From the Maxwell relations, the pressure, temperature, and the chemical potential of a system are connected to its energy. Thermodynamically, if a system is at equilibrium, its energy shall be stabilized at a corresponding state. If the pressures of phase 1 and phase 2 are unbalanced, a momentum transfer across this interface is expected. This leads to the departure from the equilibrium state of the system containing this interface. Similar argument can be made for the temperature. If unbalanced, the transfer of heat across this interface due to temperature difference shall present. Therefore, the system would be the departure from equilibrium. Here is a simple mathematical illustration to the last argument in the previous slide. Assume an amount of DN2 vapor molecules becomes liquid. From species conservation, the amount of liquid molecules increased due to this process is DN1, which equals DN2. Multiplying the chemical potentials of liquid and vapor phases with DN1 and DN2 correspondingly and sum up these two parts of energy change due to this process, the overall change of the system energy is obtained. It is clear that if the chemical potentials for liquid and vapor phases are different, there will be a net change of the overall system energy associated with the transport at the interface. This violates the assumption of equilibrium of the system containing the interface. Here we introduce a theoretical approach to evaluate the surface tension of a fluid. From the molecular theory of capillarity, the interfacial free energy is a consequence of the attractive force interactions among molecules and associated with the density gradient that exists in the interfacial region. This first equation is from mass conservation across the interface, where rho is the density profile as a function of z at the liquid vapor interface. Sigma is the free energy per unit area of interface in excess of that for step changes in density and the Helmholtz free energy per unit volume at the interface. Thermodynamically, it is required that, at equilibrium, the density profile should correspond to a minimized value of sigma. With these concepts, expressions for the surface tension and the density profile can be derived. For more details in mathematics associated with this revision, please refer to the reference book. These two equations are used to evaluate the surface tension and the thickness of the liquid vapor interface with other fluid properties and the correlation factors being provided. Furthermore, with a modification to the van der Waals fluid, this equation of state is proposed by Riedrich and Quang. This equation of state usually provides a better estimation to the fluid properties comparing to those from the original van der Waals model. To utilize this modified equation of state for estimating the saturation pressure, the procedure explained previously can be applied. Moreover, simple relation for the surface tension can be obtained by using this equation of state and the molecular theory of capillarity. Define a dimensionless thickness of the interfacial region. Note that the derivative is evaluated at the z equals zero location, 
which is determined from the density profile. Finally, this equation at the bottom is derived and can be used to estimate the characteristic thickness of the liquid vapor interface. Here are the results of predicted surface tension and the interfacial thickness for a number of fluids. The significance is that by applying the model derived for a reddish crown fluid, the dimensionless surface tension agrees well with experimental data. This is the reduced density profile across the interfacial region predicted for a reddish crown fluid at a various reduced temperature. As can be seen from this figure, with increasing temperature, the interfacial thickness increases rapidly. For a reduced temperature approaching to 1, the temperature is close to the critical point, and the interfacial region thickness predicted by this theory approaches to infinity. This is a simpler equation for predicting the interfacial thickness. In this model, the interfacial thickness can be calculated with fluid properties that could be directly measured. Note that as temperature approaching to the critical value, the interfacial thickness increases rapidly. This is consistent with the concept and the definition of critical point in thermodynamics. It shall also be noted that the molecular capillarity models described above are for flat liquid vapor interface. Molecular theories of capillarity and thermodynamic analysis predict that the interfacial tension will vary with radius of curvature when the radius of curvature becomes comparable to the thickness of the interfacial region. For example, a tiny droplet or a bubble with a radius on the order of few microns. To include this effect, one possible approach is by introducing the radius of the droplet or a bubble and the characteristic length to the correlations. Here is an example showing how to use the riederich crown capillarity theory to estimate the surface tension and the interfacial region thickness of water. So by using equation 1.41 and 1.44, the surface tension and the interfacial region thickness can be solved. It shows that the predicted surface tension is about 30% of the tabulated value for water at the same condition. Also, the effective diameter of a water molecule is estimated to be about 0.28 nanometer, which implies that the thickness of the interfacial region is about three molecules diameters. Here is an example showing how to estimate the deviation of surface tension from the flat interface for a water droplet at 100 Celsius with a diameter of 1.4 nanometer. By using equation 1.61, it is showing that the surface tension of the droplet interface is about 55% of the value for a flat interface at the same temperature. Here is a brief summary of lecture 1. Recall that there are three important questions about the liquid vapor interface at the equilibrium. First, from the molecular point of view, how to define the equilibrium state and determine the corresponding PV diagram. Second, what is the characteristic length for the interfacial region? Third, what are the main effects of interfacial tension on the liquid vapor interface? In this lecture, we introduced the fundamentals of liquid vapor phase change. We also showed that by using equation of state such as the van der Waals model, we can estimate and plot the PV relation. We also introduced the Riederich crown fluid and how to use it. From thermodynamics point of view, we showed that 
at the saturation point, it is required that pressure, temperature, and the chemical potential for liquid in the vapor phases have to be the same. Finally, we learned how to evaluate the surface tension in the liquid vapor interfacial region thickness by applying the model derived from molecular theory of capillarity. This concludes lecture one. Thank you.